Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. Which of your employees are open to the evolution of you as a leader and the evolution of your business? And which of your employees just want the business to be the same as it was when they first started three years ago? Find out. Because the ones who want it to stay the same are the ones keeping it the same. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. To wrap up this series on leadership as a spiritual teaching, in which we've discussed the definition of consciousness, how societal conditioning clouds our perception of reality, and how this prevents us from solving problems, we're going to learn how leaders and managers can start solving problems by learning and teaching a greater sense of consciousness and awareness. The problem is that you can't just change a person's conditioning without upsetting them because that's in large part who they think they are. The more it stays the same, the more people feel safe and secure. But we're lying to ourselves when we insist that life is safe and secure. The role of a leader or a manager is to take in new information, pass it on, and challenge existing conditioning. And this is what a good spiritual teacher happens to do. So that's what we're going to do. I offer weekly member webcasts, online courses, and mentorship at clearandopen.com because it's my truth that with the right tools, anyone can eliminate the people, money, and time problems holding them back in business. And I share parts of these webcasts and courses on this show because I want to help you too. If you're enjoying the show and learning from it, I'd love your feedback. If you're listening to the show on an Apple device, all you have to do is open the podcast app, view the full description of this episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review for the show. Thanks so much for listening. Let's start the show. So all of what I'm saying here is, is think of yourselves as leaders, as a kind of spiritual teacher. What does a spiritual teacher do? You know, it's one of these sort of cliche terms. The spiritual teacher fundamentally is just about helping people to get meta to their conditioning and see reality. You know, and depending on the spiritual teacher, it will go in certain ways and be about certain domains or or whatever. But we don't really have a word for someone who does that. We have coach, but there are many coaches who don't challenge people's beliefs and conditioning. They just don't go that deep. And, you know, coach invokes the kind of football, basketball coach kind of thing. And they definitely don't do that. Not directly anyway. We have therapists, and therapists are taught in the mainstream anyway that you do not challenge people's value systems, not directly. Because why? Because that's how you lose clients. That's why. (laughs) So in mainstream psychology, you don't do that. Um, Mainstream psychology is not about stripping people down to the truth. It's about helping people cope with their reality while they mostly remain the same person. That's mainstream psychology. There's lots of different kinds of therapy though. But it's not about helping people cast off false gods. That's what a false belief is. Or distortion of reality or false conditioning. So it's not going to happen in therapy. In mainstream churches, it's not going to happen, or synagogues or whatever, it's not going to happen because when you threaten people's values in that context, you lose members, and the religion's already losing members at rapid rates. So it's not going to happen there. It's not going to happen in school because you can't threaten the values and beliefs of students who are going to go home and then do it with their parents. That doesn't work. You'd start a parent-teacher war. It's not going to happen from the government because they're just too unsophisticated to pull it off. And besides, it's not their job. (laughs) And it's not in their interest. It's not not in their interest. Yeah. That of all of those constituents in the world, the government wants to keep you the least conscious as possible. They're, they're they're, They're the crusaders of unconsciousness, right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah, right behind big ag and commercial um, farming. You're right. That's probably they're probably first. 
because they're making way more money than the politicians. The politicians are just getting the kickdowns from the business people. You're right. So the giant, you know, the pharmaceuticals and the big agriculture and the, they really want you, you know, not thinking about what happens to the garbage that's in your hand that you're drinking from or, you know, what that ingredient is on the list or, you know, they don't want that at all. Not to mention the military industrial complex. Cause right. More- business another business right it's like because you know those bombs that they're when you think about the expense of those bombs like those missiles cost like 30 grand a piece you know think about if they just brought the money there instead like in wheelbarrows and like used it to help things like hey here's thirty thousand dollars in a wheelbarrow instead of a missile it's the same cost but we're going to like give it to you and help develop your infrastructure. And then like, let's sit down and have a really great meal and talk about how our countries can work with each other. No, I'd be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I didn't eat recently. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, look at all of these institutions that have no interest, no, no self-interest in the consciousness of people uh, augmenting. And then, you know, like it reminds me of my, I had a friend who was studying public policy and uh, we were talking about, I used this example before, forgive me, if you've heard it, but uh, uh, we were talking about the role of public policy and I was talking about this very thing. I said, why doesn't the, what is the role of government in augmenting consciousness? And he says, well, you know, first of all, that's, he says, I don't really think that that's the government's job. Uh, and he gave the example of the, uh, the lunch line in like a high school, a public high school, they, there's studies that show that if you put the um, the vegetables and the other good for you foods, better for you foods, at the beginning of the line and the things like the French fries and the desserts at the very end, that people eat better. This is quantifiable. So the, that's what I think the kind of thing the government does. They'll do that study and then pass down this edict that says, put the healthier food at the front of the line. And he was telling me about that. That was the kind of thing he was studying in public policy. And I was like, but that's okay. That's great. But that's treating people like sheep. You know, it's, it's what about like educating people about nutrition and food and like having classes about, Hey, how, eat this way. And how did that make you feel? And eat this other way. And how did that, you know, consciousness raising stuff. And he said, he said, you have to understand that from the government's perspective, people are sheep. And that's the basis of all public policy. They're basically figuring out, out a way. They're asking the question, how do we change the contours of the maze to get people to do what we want them to do? Not yeah, necessarily. It's all about incentives. Yeah. It's exactly. an economic view of everything. People right. have incentives. It's- so instead of changing their uh, wisdom. Yes. Uh, and in growing that, they, they only have. An incentive to... Yes, exactly. It's a kind of economic reductionism. And it's not necessarily malevolent, although it can go that way. It's just kind of practical. You know, is it easier to rearrange the lunch line, the assembly line thing, than to hire people and form new class? Of course, it's way easier to do that. It just doesn't work. (laughs) Like most easy ways out. And I also want to say, because I know I've been, I was a little critical of religion earlier. In any domain, any philosophy, any church, any synagogue, any school, any, any institution, any pharmaceutical company, any whatever, there's always a small group of people, maybe the top 10%, who are really trying to make a difference. I, I was talking with a couple of uh, staffers at a bar a few months ago who uh, worked for uh, Alaskan congressmen. And we were talking about the, the difference. They said the difference between a politician and a statesman, they said. And then they were defining a statesman or a stateswoman uh, as like, that's someone who really is working toward the greater good and not treating people like sheep, but actually trying to help raise consciousness. So in, in any group of people, there's always a fraction of them who are actually trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I think that as you've heard me say, there's no such thing as evil, I don't think. Everybody's doing what they think is best. Lots of good intentions in the world. So again, bring this back to you. 
this is the opportunity you have as leaders because it's only, it's not going to happen in big business. And I'll tell you the reason it's not going to happen in big business is because big business is controlled by stockholders. You know, those people who want to make money without doing anything. And that squeezes the whole corporate structure in a totally artificial way that causes it to act crazy. So it's in small and medium sized businesses where it's the only venue in the world where I see where consciousness can actually grow. And this is why I'm in it. Because it's the lowest hanging fruit for someone like me who likes to make differences. You have the opportunity to expand consciousness every day. Every time you're talking to an employee, ask yourself, what is their conditioning? What is the lens through which they're looking right now? In addition to what knowledge don't they know, what skill do they need that they don't have, what is their conditioning? And how can I challenge it as gently as possible so they can actually take it in? Deciding one day to spring on a congregation of 8,000 people that there is no such thing as hell was not gentle. But hey, he had to follow his heart and do what he did. And I'm sure he wouldn't have traded that decision for the world now. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Definitely wasn't prudent. (laughs) Wouldn't be prudent. Remember that? That's George Bush Sr. The sanest Republicans we had in 20 years, right? I can only hear Dana Carvey doing that. Yes. I I cannot hear George W or George Bush doing that. Just Dana Carvey. Yeah. Dana Carvey did one of the, certainly some of the best impressions we've ever seen of a president. So, so was the dialectic good for you? It's fun, right? You can do that with your employees. You know, have, bring them all together and start talking about what is excellence? What is competence? What is, and all you have to do is have in mind where you want to end up and then know the first question and you just make everything in the middle up. Isn't it also okay to not quite know where you're going to want to end up? Sure. Sometimes you don't. Or sometimes you know where you want to end up and you end up somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Running a business 101. Fake it in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Exactly. Just like running, just like just about anything in life. You know, you know the first date and then that's it. And then you just go from there, right? You know, you know how to make a baby. You don't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine, for instance, um, what is excellence? That's something I'm not sure I know. And I'm, I'm interested in what, my team members think of it. I mean, I, yeah. in cert, I have certainly have some ideas, but I would love to know what they think excellence is mm-hmm. because it's more likely that if I did that, they'd want to join in the, the pursuit of it. Yeah. Or not. Or, or not, yeah. You, you win either way. Yeah, I guess that's true. I think I'll start off with uh, what is childhood conditioning? Uh huh. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we have employees that are, we have a lot of Latinos, and that's a whole different. It's not an excuse to not have the conversation, but there's things there you got to think about too. Yes, I would, uh, well said. You got to think about it. You have to take them into consideration for your dialectic. And the yep. the, th- the thing about the 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 beauty of the question asking mode is that you can bail out at any moment. Right, you're not telling them anything. I didn't tell. Do you guys notice? I didn't tell you anything about what I thought consciousness was until the very end. I made it so that you came up with it, and I actually don't know how much I steered you toward the definition I had in mind. I was very excited when Jamie said meta. This happened five minutes, ten minutes before we started. I was brushing my teeth, thinking about what we're going to do today, and it just came to me: what is consciousness? And it just came out of nowhere. Oh, consciousness is the ability to be meta to your conditioning. I was like, cool, maybe we'll do a dialectic about that today. And so I was trying to get you guys to say the words meta and conditioning. Those were the only things I had in mind. And then I just kept asking questions. And then eventually you said them. And if it, if you guys came up with a better definition or a different one that also worked, I would have gone with that. 
That goes back to the involvement thing we started with. See how that's the connection. I think my childhood conditioning is is wanting to put levels of consciousness, like you know Roman numeral one. I, I want to be able to okay, where am I on the list? Where <laughs> you want to know where you're at in the continuum of consciousness? Yes, yes. I have good news for you. <laughs> I've been more. I've been working on creating that on and off for over a decade. And I did it. Whoa. It exists. It is the belt ranking system of clear and open. That's what that is. You shared with us a while back. Yep. It's will be officially launching when the website is up and, and then I'll actually start talking about it and work. We'll work on it in earnest, but that's what that is because you know, one of the things that I saw in the market research when I worked at EMIF is that people, especially business leaders, they want to know where they're at in relationship to their goals. And that's a tough thing. For, for one of the things you don't have when you're a leader, or one of the things you do have when you're a follower, is you have this boss that gets to say, great job with that, not great job with that, let's work on this. There's, there's structure and there's a container. You get to know where you are. You, know, you can rise up through the ranks of the organization. Leaders don't have that. And it's tough not knowing where you're at. There's, of course, freedom in it of like nobody can tell you what to do and nobody will tell you that you're bad at something and all that. And, but there's, there's a, a lack of structure. So yeah, so I created this thing hoping you'd like it. And it's a way of a system holding you accountable so that I don't have to. Uh, that was also part of my interest. And yeah, there's 12 ranks, five degrees of black belt and seven uh, ranks below it. It's an attempt to quantify not just consciousness, but skill. Like to get, for example, orange belt, all you have to do is be moderately well organized. I made it kind of low hanging fruit. Yellow belt, the next one is uh, very well organized and then beginning to see the edges of your responsibility in yourself. And then it moves from skill stuff to more consciousness stuff the higher you get. And there's skill related skill stuff like being able to ask incisive questions, open ended questions. You know, by the time you get to black belt, for example, I would expect someone to be able to lead a dialectic like I led today. And here's the fun thing. We can do that kind of stuff. So it'll be like, you know, Brady will in three months from now be applying for a rank because you have to apply, right? Let's say, for example, Brady applies for a rank and I, and he'll make a case for it. I've got a application form. It's set up as a course. And then I'll be like, hmm, okay, well, I want to see some skills presented here. So I'll be like, okay, Brady, um, this coming Thursday, you're going to do a 10 minute talk about X, Y, and Z as, to, to prove that you're worthy of the rank. We get to have fun, stuff like that. And I'll custom design uh, assignments. And you know, other times I might have you write an essay about something that I know is really hard for you to think through or something like that. Sound like fun? Yeah. 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 I was you're choosing up. you randomly, Brady. I wasn't actually insinuating anything. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I guess I'm a little scared now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I chose you. <laughs> So yeah, and you know, to me, I think, you know, uh, of course, we all know that Socrates and many other consciousness challenging people got themselves killed, and uh, that certainly should bear some sobriety. But remember that in your businesses, you you are the kings and queens, so no one's going to kill you for challenging the consciousness of your people. You're going to win either way if you find if you're gentle, if you're caring, if you're firm. And in the way you challenge people, you're going to win either way. Either you, either you will find out that they are capable of much more of what they're currently doing, or you will find out that they don't listen, they never have listened to you, and they never will. You win either way. Jamie's been actively discovering this. Hmm. I counted 13 have, are gone. Have, are gone in eight months. Is that about half? It's two more than half. It is a substantial, <laughs> yeah. So this is what I know people are really doing it when they turn over people. 
Because when you challenge consciousness, people will just go because they never signed up for that in the first place because they're incapable of change. That's those are, you know, like the, the 5% of, um, of, uh, what's his name? Carlton Pierce's congregation who stuck with him were the people who really were with him and his teaching. You know, you could argue. The rest of them just wanted to hear what they'd always been hearing and were not open to evolution. Which of your employees are open to the evolution of you as a leader and the evolution of your business? And which of your employees just want the business to be the same as it was when they first started three years ago? Find out. Because the ones who want it to stay the same are the ones keeping it the same. That gives me chills. I never thought about, never thought about that before. They're the ones keeping it the same. Because okay. they're the ones... Sorry. Go ahead. We are. Yes, you are too. But there's more of them than you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, I appreciate the integrity of that. Yeah. But like, if you change and you see the vision, right? But then you don't challenge them to do the same. They're the ones talking to your customers. They're the ones making the widgets. They're the business in some ways more than you, you know? Yeah. Depending. No, that's what I mean, though, know, is that if we don't, you know, do everything we can to make that change, then, then you know, to, to call for that consciousness. Exactly. Right? Cure them or kill them. I, you know, and I must say, I, I didn't do it at the, the level of consciousness that Jamie did, but I have eliminated six people. Out of? Well, about 27, 20, 28, right in there. That's significant. It's a good chunk of people. And yeah, you have. I pushed, I mean, I, um, goodbye. You are yeah. fired. The, my company is just so much better. It's, it's just better. And, uh, you know, so, but what the question, when Jamie was speaking, I was thinking, okay, what am I missing? I'm missing some people in here. Mm. You know, I need to get back to work. Mm. Amen. Yeah, but you're doing it. If you've eliminated people by pushing them and seeing where they wouldn't move, then you're doing it. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that Clear and Open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. If you want to help the show grow, I'd appreciate you leaving a rating and review on iTunes. All you have to do is open the Apple Podcasts app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review. Or you can go to clearandopen.com slash review, and it will bring you to the right place. If you're looking for more support on your journey, head over to clearandopen.com for even more tools, articles, and free resources. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.